Grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God for our consideration this morning comes from our gospel, John chapter 6, beginning with the 24th verse. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, It is not Moses who has given you bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the word of the Lord. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, this is obviously not the way I had intended to be with you this morning, but I'm still happy that I'm able to be here to share God's word with you. I don't know what it's like in your house, but in my house it seems to be a weekly battle. Plans are made and supplies are gathered Strategies are employed to see how we are going to tackle it. What I'm talking about is our weekly meal plan. Questions have to be answered. What supplies do we have on hand? Who's going to go grocery shopping? When are we going to have what meal and what sides are we going to have with it? Who's going to make it? All of these things go into preparation for the meals for the week. And then there's always that question of what amount of money is there to purchase those supplies? Because some weeks there may be a feast and other weeks there may be a fast. Sometimes by choice, sometimes out of necessity. What happens? You go through all this process. You make the weekly meal plans. But then... Once the meal is consumed, once the bellies are filled, you have to do it all over again. The next day, you have to make the the meal again, and the next week you have to plan for another week's worth of meals. This week I happened to see a picture posted by the wife of one of my friends, and she had 15 freezer meals prepared before they begin their school year. And I have to admit, I was a little envious because I started thinking we should really do that. That would take a lot of time and effort out once you have that all done. But now think about what life was like for those in first century Palestine. They didn't have the benefits of freezer meals. They didn't even have freezers. And so the the concern for bread, the concern for food, was a regular thing. They didn't have the preservatives we have. They didn't have the refrigerators that can keep food for days or even longer. And so the concern for how you were going to be fed was something that was constantly being thought of. And today as we study God's Word, we see some people who are concerned about that, And they think they might have the solution about how they will never go hungry again. They look at Jesus, thinking he is the solution, which he is, but not in the way that they thought. Bread is something that is a necessity to life. No matter where you are in the world, 
It can make the difference between life and death. Well, we see that bread was on the minds of the people of Israel in our Old Testament lesson for today. Or maybe more precisely, a lack of bread was on their minds. And this lack of bread is what triggered the subsequent actions that happen, the subsequent events. They began to grumble and complain after they had made their exodus out of Egypt because they didn't have any food readily available. They started looking back nostalgically about all the food that they had in Egypt more than they could ever want or need. They began to complain. That grumbling and complaining really is what caused the Lord to act. He promised his chosen leaders, Moses and Aaron, and told them he was going to do something about it. He was going to act. He was going to do something about it by giving the people the bread that they absolutely needed. Here we have that promise made. God was going to provide them bread from heaven. And what happens is, as they wake up in the morning, they see this strange substance on the ground, this manna, this bread from heaven. They didn't know what it was. And yet, what do we find out about that? That manna that they were given, it didn't last. Sure, it preserved them for those 40 years in the wilderness, but at the end of each day, it would come to an end and then they would have to collect more the next day. And those who tried to make it last longer found out the consequences of their untrusting actions as it spoiled. Well, now, fast forward to our lesson today. The people of the crowd had experienced the feeding of the 5,000. They had been a part of that. They had shown no concern. They had made no preparations. They did not watch over the, the fire and make sure that the food didn't burn. Jesus simply gave it to them. He provided for them. And they liked it. And they wanted more of it. And so that's what spurred them on to leave the shores of the Sea of Galilee and cross the sea in pursuit of Jesus at Capernaum because they, want, they had tasted that miracle and they wanted more of it. And so when they finally found Jesus, they were overjoyed, but wanted in on how he had gotten there. Because they knew that Jesus hadn't left with the disciples the night before. And so they knew there must have been another miracle, but Jesus didn't indulge them with the details. Rather, he recognizes their wrong motivation for coming to him. And he tries to redirect their attention. He says, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. You see, Jesus recognized that they were urgent to indulge in that miracle some more. But they didn't see those signs for what they were. Those were God's seal of approval. They were showing that Jesus was exactly who he said he was, the true Son of God. But they didn't believe him. Instead, Jesus tries to redirect them. He tells them, Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Even in this warning, the people still didn't get it. They still are pressing him that there's something here that's not quite what they have in mind. They were looking for Jesus not because they thought of him as the Savior he had revealed himself to be, but the Savior they wanted him to be. The one who would always provide for all of their physical needs. And so then they ask Jesus a few questions. They say, what must we do to do the works God requires? What sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Do you notice the problem? It's really twofold. First of all, they think that there is a list of things that they can do, things that they are able to check off of a list of things that God requires so that they can be made pleasing to God in his sight. They actually think that they can present themselves as objects that will make themselves lovable to him. And the other thing is has to do when it comes to Moses. 
You see, the people held up Moses as kind of the standard. He was the great one. He was the one that provided bread to their forefathers in the wilderness. And Jesus, well, he used fish and loaves of bread to provide a little bit more, but it wasn't as great as Moses. And so really their question to Jesus is, okay, well, what else do you got? How quickly their memory of the impossible had fade, faded. Jesus had taken that boy's sack lunch and provided enough for thousands to eat. And that wasn't good enough for them. They said, give us another sign. And then, if we judge it worthy, then we'll believe in you. You know, we haven't seen a miracle like the feeding of the 5,000. But God still provides us for us in a no less miraculous way. Think about where you go grocery shopping, whether you go to Ralph's or Albertson, Stater Brothers or Winco. You walk into the stores and you see shelf upon shelf that are filled with food. How did that happen? You might think by natural means from farms and factories. People brought it in and harvested it and now we have the food in the stores, which is true. But it's all a part of God's blessing. It's from his hand of blessing. Yet even when we see that, sometimes it's easy for us to treat God's blessings with contempt. We might look at our lives and say, you know, right now I'm starting to struggle with my health. God, where are you? How come you're not taking care of me? Yet gone from our memory is the 30, 40, 50 years of good health that he has given us. Or maybe over the last year and a half we found ourselves struggling financially and maybe we even admit, God, you've provided for me, you've taken care of me. But what else do you got? Or maybe we even approach it the same way, asking that same question the people asked and say, what do we have to do to do the works of God? As though we are able to go to church enough or go to Bible class enough or be charitable with our neighbors enough or volunteer enough in order for us to win his approval and his love. You see, the fact is, whether we treat his blessings with contempt, whether we have short-term memory and don't remember all the ways that he has blessed us, or whether we think that we can do something to earn his approval, all of that is working for food that spoils, as Jesus told the crowd. All of that will cause us to hunger again because none of that fills us spiritually. And that's why God reveals for us in his word how it is that we will never go hungry again. It's through him. It's through Jesus. Think back to that question that the people asked. What do we have to do to do the works of God? They were focused on their doing, but listen how Jesus answers them. The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Doing the work of God is not checking off this long list of requirements that God asks of us. No, the work of God is the work that God does. It's his calling to faith. It's his bringing to faith. It's the Holy Spirit using word and sacraments to find lost souls and to bring them into his kingdom. That's how God works his work. And now he simply says to the individual, believe it. That's all you do, is you believe what I have already done for you in Jesus. Faith is that trust. Faith is that trust that God has done everything to make us right with him. Faith is that trust that God has given Jesus to be the Savior of the world. The one who came as the perfect human being. The one who kept God's laws perfectly for us. The one who sacrificed himself on his cross for the times that we show contempt for his blessings, for the times that we are have those short-term memories of all the things he has done for us, the times that we even put ourselves up as doing things to make ourselves acceptable to him 
That's why Jesus went to the cross for you and for me. And by his resurrection, he says none of that sin that we have committed sticks to us any longer because he has done it all for us. You think about what the people had held up and they said, Moses is the one that you have to match up to. You have to be as good or as great as Moses. And Jesus tells them, I'm not as great as Moses, but I'm greater. Because Moses wasn't the one that provided the bread in the desert. That was my father. And that bread only lasted for a short time. But look at what is right before your very eyes. Look at what God is giving to you today. He says, very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Manna fell from the skies, but the true bread came from heaven itself because that's who Jesus is. The one who is enthroned in heaven came to walk in in this earth to be with his people. That's what God has done through Jesus. And some of their sense that some of the people there sense that Jesus was talking about something a little bit deeper than simply physical bread. And so they ask him, We want what you're you're talking about here. Finally, Jesus doesn't hide it any further, but he tells them. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Eating the bread of life means believing in Jesus. It means trusting that he did absolutely everything, from living a perfect life to laying down his life, to rising from the dead, to calling us to faith and bringing us into his family. Jesus has done everything, and when we dine on him, when we believe in him, we will never go hungry again. Thinking about meal plans. You know, you put in the time, you put in the effort, you put in the preparation for those meals so that you take a little bit of stress out of your life during the week. You take a little bit of guesswork out. But right now, you are feasting on the bread of life. You are hearing the word of God. What are your spiritual meal plans? Now is your big meal during the week. Well, what are you going to do for the rest of the week? Are you going to make sure that you have time in that word? Are you going to make sure that you have something to sustain you from week to week? Well, think about the opportunities that we have. God has made the bread of life so readily available on our phones, on our computers. Pick up a daily devotion. And snack on the Word of God. You think about the meal that we have today, digging into the Old Testament lesson and the Epistle lesson. You think about chewing on the sermon. But for the rest of the week, think of how you're going to continue to feed yourself. Spend some time in prayer, talking to your Heavenly Father, giving thanks for the many blessings that He has provided for you praying about how he might put you to work in his kingdom now. Looking forward to next week, when he provides the supper where we can feast on the body and blood of Christ for our forgiveness. But make plans, spiritual plans, on how you can eat. And my encouragement for you is this. Be a grazer. Don't simply be a binger who on Sunday morning, binges on God's word, and then the rest of the week goes hungry. But be a grazer. At our family get-togethers, we always have our meals planned out, but there always seems to be plenty of food available between mealtime. Snacks available so that you never go hungry throughout the course of the day. Never let yourself become spiritually famished, but feed on God's word, because as you do, he not only builds you up in the faith, but he sustains you, he empowers you so that you can be about the work of his business, serving him. God has given us the opportunity. He has made it available in his storehouses open to us so that we can feast on the bread of life. We can believe in our Savior Jesus and be brought ever closer to him through his word and sacraments. 
so that you and I never go hungry again. Amen. Now the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.